Hello, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Week four, what's going on? Yes, yeah, so welcome week four, everyone. The gift, the irresistible offer. That's right, that's right. So first of all, I just want to make sure that you guys are completing you know, each homework, each sheet, because if you haven't done a lot of that stuff, this might be hard to follow or hard to implement. So just make sure that you're um, you know, kind of following the step by step because there's a reason for for the order and everything. So yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's a reason why everything is in a sequential order. So yes, if you haven't done those, please do go back before you do the work that we're going to be giving you today. Okay, so jumping in, the main objective of this lesson, I have crafted my irresistible offer for my ideal avatar based on market research and data. So by the end of this lesson, you will definitely be able to find who the ideal avatar is, the perfect offer for them. And the key topics, number one, breaking false beliefs. Number two, minimum viable product. Number three, evolution of offers. Number four, how to validate your offer. Number five, power positioning. And then number six, your irresistible offer. Okay, yes. so diving in with do it. the first one. Okay, so breaking false beliefs. When it comes to crafting an offer for their ideal clients, most people take the more is more approach and make it all about themselves. Yes, we wanted to begin by giving some examples of some false beliefs that a lot of people tend to go towards when they are trying to think of what does their ideal avatar really want from them. Okay, and so... It's a great example. False belief number one, they believe that adding more things to their offer will make it more valuable. So this is the more is more approach. And so a lot of people, what they'll do is they will add many, many different reports. They'll give multiple deliverables, deliverables. They'll give the client or the customer they have the billable hours basically everything that will give them a very detailed breakdown of, you know, how they're charging them and what amount of time, where time is specifically going. All the things they get. We used to do that too. Yes. Yeah. I think that a lot of us tend to think in the beginning that it's, it's being transparent, right? Mm -hmm. We'll think like maybe if we're more transparent with people, you know, that will build trust and that they will really, um, I guess, enjoy seeing that. They'll think that we're a better a better service provider to yeah, them that exactly. we're more caring. And I true. mean, the intention is good. Therefore, if that's, you know, if that's what you're thinking, if you've done this as well in the past, the intention is obviously good. You want to be transparent, open and honest. But the matter of the fact is that all that really does is really overwhelm people. And you end up giving them a lot of things that they really actually don't even value or really care about. Um, it's really what we think they care about and we're assuming that and more often than not they really don't So it's kind of like stacking all these things into a giant box and thinking oh the more I give them the more they're gonna like and it's like no I actually don't need any of these things. I only wanted the one thing at the bottom <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly, right? Yeah, so Here's here is a, a, a metaphor that can maybe help you understand this even better. So it's as if you you know, someone just went to the grocery store and gave you all of these raw materials. They gave you lettuce and tomatoes and mushrooms and peppers and apples and fruits and all these different things. And all you really wanted was, you know, a very specific meal. So on the right here, it's a, you know, a chicken teriyaki dish. Mm -hmm. And so let's say that's the dish that you were craving and that's all that you wanted. You didn't need, you know, a whole head of lettuce you didn't need a whole batch of broccoli you didn't need a whole stack of carrots you yeah. just really wanted enough to make that meal yeah and so it's the difference between you know going to a supermarket and stocking up on raw materials versus going to a nice you know sit down fancy restaurant you exactly. just want to have a nice meal out with a friend exactly and in that example you're not you know the or the people going to that restaurant they're not paying for you know the amount of food items that they're getting right they're mm -hmm. paying for the value because they really love the flavor or they really love the environment or they really right, love so the service they really exactly so now all of a sudden something that was less items you know before like if you were to like tell this to someone you know in you know the old days they'll say like no you're crazy i need more food like more items because it's going to help me survive or eat longer but this is not the case especially with people that already have their you know needs covered 
well, you want to pay what you value. Avatar, right? Exactly. If your avatar just wants to go to have a meal at a restaurant, they're not the person that really, you know, wants to, yeah, suck up on a whole pile of groceries, almost like a yeah. survival. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to knowing your avatar. They just want to oh, go to yeah. a nice place to have a nice meal. So knowing who is up here serving. Because mm-hmm. if they desire a very specific meal, giving them the other one is just completely overwhelming and useless, really, yeah. in their eyes. That's it. Okay. And false belief number two. <laughs> you are Hello, your ideal Barney. avatar's hero. And as you can see on the right side, we have a picture of Barney, how I'm much mother. I'm sorry <laughs> I can't hear you over the sound of how awesome I am. And whether we want to believe it or not, oftentimes we tend to really take on this perspective. We may not realize it, but we in some way feel that we are the hero of our client, our ideal avatar's story, that we are saving them. And while you are, yes, helping them, you're not the hero. And so we tend to go on and on about or worry about, stress about, you know, our diplomas and our degrees, our qualifications, our looks, our fancy suit, our fancy dress, office, expensive car, social media profile, book that we wrote, features on TV, website article. And maybe it's one or two of these things that you may be more worried about. A lot of the time, I know for us, it was, you know, even qualifications and length of experience when we first began this journey years ago. And the matter of the fact is that a lot of the people that we learned about online business from, about marketing and all these different things, we didn't follow them or value their knowledge because they had a fancy diploma from a really expensive yeah, university. That's right. Actually, most of them, if not all of them, actually don't even have degrees in marketing or anything of that sort. I remember reading mm-hmm. that in, I think it was Expert Secrets, mm-hmm. uh, Russell Brunson was saying, you know, He'd say to a lot of his clients who didn't believe that they could sell their knowledge because they didn't have a degree or diploma. He's like, he's like, what do you think I have? Do you think I have some kind of a degree from my right. university? And they're like, well, don't you? <laughs> he's like, no, I don't. I don't have anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't even know if he finished college. Right. <laughs> so exactly. at the end of the day, people don't really care about all those things. And that's really all about you. And all it's really going to lead you to do is become really insecure and not take a lot of action because you're worried about yourself more than giving an end result to the person that you're serving. And so while your ideal avatar cares about you and definitely needs your help to achieve their desired result, they are the hero of their journeys, not you. You are their guide. And so as you can see, I, love below, that. I have a little <laughs> graphic here of Sam and Frodo, where Frodo is telling Sam, Frodo wouldn't have gotten very far without Sam. And so obviously, as we know, if you've seen Lord of the Rings, or The Hobbit, you know that Frodo is definitely the hero of Lord of the Rings. But Sam is his guide. He's the one that's always there for him, that's helping him, that's giving him advice. Yeah. He's always got his back. Yeah. And that is who you are for your ideal. Yeah. And we're going to dive deeper into this um, later in the, in the program. But for now, you need to understand just basic, at a basic level, you know, your role in this whole situation. And if you really do focus on the avatar, you really do focus on that desired result and you start eliminating those false beliefs um, that you might have about yourself, that you might not be valuable, that you might not be enough, that you might not know enough to, you know, charge what you deserve or to charge high ticket. And, you know, again, if you have some questions, it's usually either A, you haven't picked a big enough problem or a, you know, a scary problem enough or B, you're simply just not believing it yourself and you just have to go for it and like start pitching people, start talking to people, start putting your offers out there. And then, you know, after 20 to 30 tries, after, you know, you have enough data, then you can make an informed decision. And we're going to get more into that. Right. So at the end of the day, the only thing that truly matters is your ability to bridge the gap between your ideal avatar's current self. That's it. And desire that's itself. it don't make it more complicated than it needs to be just really focus on this like that blog that you see there those two people holding it like visualize that as much as possible because that's literally going to be the only way that you'll be able to uh, simplify it so that you don't overwhelm yourself or you don't want to you know include all these different things in your offer just so that you know you feel it's more valuable but in reality it's not Right. For them, the real value is coming from you honestly just delivering that desire itself to them, Mm -hmm. helping them achieve that. Mm -hmm. That is the one thing that truly, truly matters. 
Okay, and so now we're going to get into the minimum viable product. So because most people therefore believe that they are their ideal client's hero, they try to give as much of themselves as possible. They give their clients an immense amount of their time, energy, and resources, many of which are not only completely undesired by their clients, but ones that also put a ridiculous amount of unnecessary demand on themselves. Right. So again, going back to this, we think that, you know, what they really want is us, that they really mm -hmm. just want more of our time. They mm -hmm. just want to see our face more. They just want to hear our voice more. And no, again, while they do care about you and they've obviously chosen you to be the guy, the one that's going to get them to that result, it's not you that they are really desiring to see every day and hear. It's the result that you have promised them, the result that you promised to guide them towards, right? And most people tend to do the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so a way that you can really understand how you can actually do the opposite of giving all of your time and all of your resource and all of your energy is by asking yourself this golden question. What is the least amount of you, your time, energy, and resources that you can give to your client while successfully helping them achieve their desired results? Okay, so as simple as that. You still, of course, always want to desire that you are giving the result to the best your best ability possible, that they're getting exactly what they signed up for, and possibly even more, but doing the least amount, giving the least amount of your time, energy, and resources that you are not burned out and giving far, far too much they don't even really want. Yeah, and I'll add something here because, you know, this is a very common trap, and we were trapped in this for, for a little while until, uh, yeah, we invested some money with, uh, you know, Jeff, one of my mentors, and he kind of, uh, you know, shaped my, my mind on this because we are, you know, as entrepreneurs, we are to work on the business, not in the business. When you get so caught up in, in just the day-to-day -day and you don't allocate enough time to grow your business, then it's never going to grow. And some people never get out of that cycle because they don't understand how to do it. And we didn't understand how to do it for a long time. And this is one of those traps because you start investing a lot of your time, energy, and resources that either A, you can easily outsource at a, in a way or at a price that it's like 100% worth it for you, or B, you're not simplifying enough. They care about the result. They care about that, you know, product that you're going to make, that you're going to create, that is going to have, you know, exactly what they need to bridge that gap between who they are right now and who they want to become. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in this uh, golden question, because again, it's, uh, you know, something that will dictate pretty much the success of, you know, making people be like, wow, like that's a super compelling offer and having like high conversion rates or being something that's like, uh, I don't know, you know, or just not desirable enough. Right. Exactly. So the goal of the question, therefore, is not about taking value away from your clients. It's about getting rid of anything that doesn't truly help them get results. And the reality is, is that if you can get somebody results, they don't really care about anything else. That is really the main reason. And so it's not about ever cheating your clients out of any kind of value or giving them less things they actually want. No, it's just about getting rid of things that are quite honestly a waste of time and completely of disinterest to your ideal avatar anyways. Right? So it really benefits both parties. Both parties are getting exactly what they want and desire out of the relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the rules of engagement with the golden questions. These are three different rules that you always want to keep in mind when you are asking yourself that question. So rule number one, talk about the desired results, not what you will do for them or what you will give them. Right, so this goes back to, you know, kind of piling a whole bunch of different things inside of a bag, or inside of a box and thinking that, oh my gosh, they're going to look at this and think, wow, they're giving me more than anybody else. This is supposed to be the person that I'm supposed to go with. But the reality is, is that when you talk about what you're going to give them and what you're going to do, oftentimes you lose them. You start, you know, as Russell Brunson would say, you start doing techno babble or you start talking in a right. language of, you know, in your area of expertise, which they're really not aware of or else they wouldn't. Yeah, you overwhelm them help. and then it's like gone. Right. So you kind of lose them. They start, you, you use a whole bunch of vocabulary and say things that you're going to do. They don't even understand it. So they get lost. So instead, you need to talk about what they're actually getting out of it. What's the desired result, which is at the end of the day, again, the only thing that they really care about. Yeah. And again, this could be a physical result. If it's like, you know, in, in the health niche, 
Um, it might be a status if it's in the wealth niche and it might be a, you know, emotional if it's more in the like relationships or even uh, on satisfying certain things. Like, you know, just before this lesson, we we're talking about how like even a cup or a uh, picture frame can literally be a bridge between like where they are to where they want to go because they believe that that thing or that product or your specific you know service uh, that, that that you're creating is gonna give them that feeling that result that certainty um, and and so that's why it's, it's very interesting because no matter again like let me just reference back to this bridge like no matter what product it is physical non physical um, a training, a, you know, something that you actually mail, like you, you're bridging a gap. And so I'll, I will keep coming back to this because this is all there ever is. Again, if you've done successfully the vision, you would know that you are the um, current self right now and you're trying to be a desired self, a, a self that is going to make more money, that might be having more time with their family and kids. Um, you know, anything that you desire that it's in this future, you know, in this vision, same with your avatar. So just keep making that connection because a lot of the times, um, and, and you'll see this, that the marketplace is flooded, flooded with um, people that just keep stacking and they talk and talk and talk about their benefits and about all these different things. Meanwhile, people are just wondering, like, how can I bridge the gap? Well, the example that kind of came to mind or like a metaphor that came to mind mm -hmm. when you're talking about that, it's kind of like, you know, if your appendix exploded and you went to the doctor right. and they were told you, you know, a step-by-step a, a -step breakdown of what they were going to do <laughs> to make you feel better. And you're like, I, okay, that's great. I, I trust you. <laughs> um, but I just, I just want to stop being excruciating pain now. So just put me right. under and do what you got to do. I don't need to know every single step. Right. And there's a time and a place to obviously know that procedure, you know, like, like obviously the client does want to know, Hey, like what is that process that gets me to there? And I'm going to talk about that in, right. in, in a minute, but this is about, um, then the way that you're presenting everything or where you're spending the most time where most people spend time talking about themselves and then 20% talking about um, the, the result where it's really the other way around. So anyways. Yeah, exactly. So rule number two, Price your offer by the value of having the desired results, not the time or hard costs involved with you delivering it. Mm -hmm. So again, we, um, you know, as people living in modern society who tend to be coming from nine to five jobs and whose parents and parents' parents and everyone lived in this kind of society where we truly believe that we are valued based on time, that we're paid for our time. And coming out of that mindset is really important when you're asking yourself this question because just because you teaching a skill to someone or you giving someone a desired result may not take that much time just because you've studied this skill so much, you've become such an expert that it only takes you an hour or maybe two hours, whatever it may be, doesn't mean that you should therefore undervalue yourself and be charging by time because you think it's only, you know, it's too short to charge them a certain higher amount. That's not true. You want to be remembering that you are charging based on the value, all of the, the effort and the time that it took you to master that skill and what that is really valued to them. Yeah. Right. What that value is to them when they achieve that. And it could be hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. Yeah. That's really subjective based on what you are giving them. Yeah. And I'll give you a really good example because um, when we were selling, uh, a lot of our services, right? Like building websites, like making videos, like sure, like we, we, we could price, you know, certain things, um, you know, pretty highly, but the problem sometimes was not so much that the clients wouldn't pay for it. The problem was that <laughs> the way I was presenting it and the way that they thought about it too would be like, Hey, well, how many hours is it going to take you to do this? Because again, ev everyone in this society is used to being valued or paid per hour. But in reality, when it comes to the problem, people will just see it as a bridge gap. And so making that, that difference and, and that switch to pricing on value, like for example, a lot of the things that we're giving you guys here, like it took us months, months of losing money, months of, you know, hustling, months of, you know, failed calls and failed projects and like just different things that didn't work out because again, we didn't know a lot of this information. And if we did, we didn't implement it. So if you take those months and you 
cut them in half or you cut them in a third or even less that it will take you, then how much more valuable it becomes. It's not so much about the time that it took us. It's right. more about the time that's going to save you. So the value is completely different. Right. And you're mm -hmm. exactly, and you're thinking of all the pain mm -hmm. <laughs> that we've gone through all to right. acquire these skills and that they're going to be going through the same things if they do not, you know, buy your product, take you up on your offer yeah. and do your services. That you know how painful what they're going to experience is going to be. And so you are saving them from all of those unnecessary consequences. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We'll go deeper into it um, later, but just remember these rules. Exactly. Okay. And the last rule, rule number three. Only provide the bare minimum of yourself to achieve the desired results, not the most amount of yourself possible. So again, asking yourself, you know, what is the absolute minimum of my time, of my effort, of my resources that I can give to these people, to this person, while still delivering an excellent result, the one that they truly desire to have, that's going to change their life immensely. And that is it's extremely, extremely important to always keep in mind. It's not more of you. It's just achieving that desired result in the most effective and efficient way possible. That's true. Okay. And now getting into the evolution of offers. Okay. So starting from the very bottom, it goes done for you, done with you, one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, and online programs. And so starting from the very bottom, done for you is basically where all of us usually tend to start, right? Right. We are delivering some kind of a service or product that is completely out of the customer's hands, really. They don't have to do anything except take it. Yeah, buy it, from getting it. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, as an example, this could be, um, you know, like we used to be in social media marketing right. and a lot of the times our clients sure. would, right. They really wouldn't have to do anything. They would just give us their you know, accounts tell us, you know, that they wanted us to, you know, to manage their accounts with content and replying to people and yada, yada, yada. And we would do absolutely everything for them. And they'll literally be like out of the picture. Right. Completely. Usually like we wouldn't even like, know what we were doing. That's right. Yeah. So they'd just be like, oh, cool. You're getting results. Awesome. Keep right. going. Right. That's it. Exactly. So most of us tend to start here. And the reason is because it's the lowest entry point, right? It's easiest to sell done for you services because most of us really want things to be done for us. Yeah. <laughs> it's the reason why fast food, everything quick in our technology age is so desirable because we like quick service where we have to do the least amount of effort as possible. Yeah, you don't want to go and have to uh, plant a seed, wait for it to grow, grab your veggie, go cut it. No, you want to go and get a delicious veggie meal done for you, right? So again, this applies to uh, any kind of service, any kind of craft, any kind of... Um, you know, thing that you provide to a customer. But that's usually, again, the beginning. And, and that is because it takes you the most amount of you. Like when right. we were doing that, we were capping, like, you know, our, our highest month, I, I, I believe it happened around um, 2017, like November or so, like before going to Thailand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And basically we were managing, I think like 14, 15 clients, like a month, like at a time. Sure, the money was great, but we were like, Oh my gosh, like we're working like crazy yes. and we didn't know how to get out of that, right? And that's because we didn't understand how to leverage other things, uh, other people's times, information, money, etc., to not be the bottleneck, right? Exactly. Of, the, of, of the whole thing or having to always be custom. Again, there is a time and place for custom, um, but I think it's just uh, worth mentioning that if you are exchanging again a lot of your um, time then if you are not working if you're not putting in the time then you got no business like you you know you can't go on vacation for a month otherwise you won't be able to exactly. right deliver so just things like that to keep in mind but yeah i'll let you keep going in that just right. important. Mm -hmm. exactly so basically the main takeaways are done for you are that yes they are the easiest to sell because you are doing the most and providing the most of yourself in any of these offers but they are also the most time and energy yeah consuming. harder to scale harder to you know go above the six figure right range. and done with you is similar but obviously yeah okay a little bit less time and effort because this is more of an agreement where you have with your clients where you have certain responsibilities and they also have their own responsibilities so even within the social media agency we did this with some people as well where we um you know, told them that we needed or they wanted to make certain content. So we taught them about how to make content and that they would be then doing that themselves and then giving it to us to post and 
and respond to comments and make, take care of their advertising. And so their responsibilities were split. So yeah, it's a little bit less time energy consuming, but you're still very much um, giving a lot of yourself. And so then we start getting into the coaching. So one-on-one -on -one coaching. So this is now where you are basically just sharing your expertise, your knowledge, your skills with one person at a time in a lot more intimate setting, whether that be in person or online. Um, and when you get to one-on-one -on -one coaching and group coaching for that matter, this is when you really start to take back a lot of your time. Um, it is more just about you delivering what you know to someone and they are now taking a lot of the responsibility because they are the ones that now need to implement this, right? They're the ones that need to take the action. You're giving them all of the, you're guiding them to the path, but at the end of the day, it's their choice to walk down it. And while they do take a lot more responsibility, this is where transformation really starts to happen because you are yeah, handing deeper, over, deeper transformation right, sounds you like. are handing over your knowledge to them to implement on their own in a very profound yeah, it's way. like downloading like brain you know like downloading uh like valuable information and again what happens one uh again in that like kind of capping going from one-on-one to group coaching is that because it's one-on-one -on -one, you're, ex you're, you're, ex you're exchanging your time at a higher rate yes that's why you it makes more sense but at the same time you are not um you know, leveraging other things. That's why you go into group coaching where now you can get, um, yeah, like more people so going through people. it. Yeah, so in multiple people with a more systematic approach, right? Versus one-on-one, -on -one, which again, I started doing that, uh, yeah, like pretty much a year and a bit ago. And while it was very rewarding, I noticed that I couldn't like work more hours. Like I had capped at my hours. So it was everything was always so custom. So there was no things that I could, you know, keep doing over and over that I could leverage, that I could, um, not yeah, a lot of really predictability. Do. And then therefore not a lot of scalability because you just have to have so many, yeah, so many very, clients. Very key word. Right. So the group coaching is definitely what helps you, well, increase your income and your impact because you are teaching multiple people at one time with a setting that is still, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, still fairly intimate. Even if you have, you know, anything below, 15, 12 people, it's still quite an intimate setting. So then you get all the way up to online programs. And that is when you have completely mastered your craft, become a specialist, mastered your skills to an incredible degree because you've gone through usually, if not all of these different levels, at least most of them, you've gone from done for you, maybe to one-on-one -on -one coaching and then group coaching and then online. So an online program now allows you to leverage a great amount of your time, energy, effort, because it's just, you know, a program that you've created that you've essentially duplicated yourself thousands of yeah. millions of times and you don't actually have to be there, but all of your knowledge is there and you know that you have your methodology, your system dialed in perfectly for a deal client and you know that it gets results yeah, it's predictably. Like, that's basically when you can almost like duplicate yourself because it's so systemized that you can get someone else to literally give it for you or you know, it, again, doesn't require um, for you to be in you person, to physically be there. Um, doing, mm -hmm. doing that. So anyway, and the more you grow into this, the more your income grows and also the more time you uh, start taking back and stuff. Um, yeah, like basically overworking or exchanging your, your time for money. Um, but yeah, there's different ways to do it. We're going to get uh, different into it a little bit more. But Exactly. So all in all, however, when you start getting to, you want to get to a point where you're at one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, online program. You want to get up to those higher levels because you will get more time, effort, and you will therefore be able to make more impact. And so you are, you should be eventually at some point going through these different levels. That is the goal. Okay. And this is essentially just explaining, you know, again, why you should charge by value instead of time. And that is, again, going one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, and your online program. You're charging now for value, much more in value than on time. Okay, so imagine this scenario. You've just broken your arm and you rush to the hospital. When you see the doctor, she tells you that your treatment is going to cost $7,500 and will take about two hours. Upset? You respond that it shouldn't cost $7,500 since it will only take her a couple hours. The doctor asks you, well, if you'd like, I can take five hours to treat your broken arm. Would you like the procedure to take five hours instead of two hours? 
So obviously, as you can see here, that if you're just upset about the amount of time, not about the actual result, then maybe you need to kind of reevaluate what kind of thinking you have here. Yeah. And so obviously, it's just, it should be painful. That they want to get that as as fast as possible, as direct as possible, and and yeah, like time time never comes back. Like this is your, so one your resource you'll never get back. Yeah. Exactly. So obviously, that would be completely ridiculous you would never respond that you wanted to take longer. <laughs> you would want the doctor to treat your broken arm in only two hours so that you could get out of pain as soon as possible. And so evidently, you should think of your offer in the exact same way. And if there was a procedure that would do it in like one minute, believe me, <laughs> people, people would pay like a hundred grand to just go to the doctor and in one minute, your arm is back to good. Exactly. For sure. Like people will pay right, that and, that, and then it will come with like, you know, uh, 3D different body parts and stuff like that, maybe it'll be possible, who knows? But you always want to see the whole value and not just get caught in like the hours the or so the amount of things or all these different fallacies on making offers, right? So, right. We know it's hard to get out of that. You're, mm. you're, you've lived in that, yeah. you've been raised in that. I know it's hard to get out of it. Definitely necessary yeah. to change that thinking. And so just to clarify more about um, what kind of questions you'd be asking yourself or what's kind of entailed when you are thinking of eventually then getting to one-on-one -on -one coaching and or group coaching are what is the desired result of your niche ideal avatar? Okay, what is it they truly desire? How can you help them achieve it within six to 12 months? So generally speaking, oh, sorry, weeks. <laughs> Um, generally within one-on-one -on -one coaching and group coaching, you want to do a program or some kind of a service that is within that time. Usually we don't want to go over that because now it's just, it's just getting too long and too demanding. It's just being dragged out too long. Realistically, you should be able with your expertise to get them there. In that yeah. time. I, I will say there are times where, um, people go very, very high ticket and they do like a one year thing with, with, with clients on just one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I think that, yes, that can work, but once again, you're leveraging a lot of your time. And so we go back to the question of like, what kind of business do you want? Like if you want to have a lot um, of free time with your family and some of your other hobbies or whatever it might be, then you want to be able to condense that into a six to 12 weeks because you're able to deliver the transformation faster. People pay more money and you essentially make more money per time spent, you know, if you want to look at it that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. exactly. Okay, and then so what is it costing them to stay where they are without Great question. fixing the problem? Great question. So what is it costing them emotionally? What is it costing them mentally? What's it costing them financially? Right. So going back to the ideal avatar when you were asked to answer questions about what are their greatest problems, what are their greatest pains, their greatest desires, go back to those questions and really evaluate like what what struggles are they going through emotionally? How's it making them feel? Is it making them feel insecure? Are they feeling like a failure? Are they feeling like they're unloved? Are they feeling like they are constantly anxious and stressed and overwhelmed financially? Are they losing thousands of thousands of dollars each and every year because they don't know how to do what you want to teach them, right? So usually the stakes are extremely high. Evidently, if you want to be solving a pain form of problem, they're going to be paying you a substantial amount of money. So really go back and find what, what is it costing them if they stay exactly where they are and they do nothing about it. And then what is the value of them achieving the desired result? Okay, so then the complete opposite on the other end of the spectrum then. Once you've evaluated what are the stakes, how high are the stakes emotionally, mentally, financially, really evaluate, you know, if you're going to be making them, let's say in your business, $100,000, you should be able to charge, you know, at least $10,000 to get them that result because you know they're going to be getting much, much higher results and they're going to make that money back in you know a month. Yeah, and for example, um, look, I think I'll give a couple examples here just to solidify it. Um, emotionally, a great example is anyone that's in the relationship niche, like any type of dating, any type of like marriage counseling and all that because again, how is it that there are some that are charging like 40, 50, a hundred dollars an hour stuck in that model versus some that are saying, listen, I'll fix your relationship for, you know, in 90 days for 45 grand, 50 grand. There's people out there that pay it. The question is how painful it is. If you're kind of just sort of fighting a little bit here, a little bit there, eh, it might not be much, but if you're like in a 
bad place where you're like super close to divorce, like you're sleeping in different rooms, you're maybe even like completely gone the whole day, kids are suffering. Like, believe me, that problem is very pervasive and very hard. So it's like, you know, in every industry, in every niche, in every product, there's always the people that are like in very little pain about certain things and the people that are in like big pain. You always want to go right. for the ones that are big. And the ones that are ready to actually do something about it. Yeah, exactly. The ones that are ready to take action. Because the ones that are just starting to maybe realize, like, again, you, you can make someone. <laughs> there are people that are in a lot of pain that still will not do anything. Yeah, it depends on the person. That, and so yeah. you need to find someone who is recognizes, is humble enough to say, okay, I am in a lot of pain right now. I'm in a lot of problems and I really don't know how to solve this. Yeah. Right. Or maybe I could solve it over the span of two years, but you know what? This marriage could fall apart in five months if I would do something now. Yeah. Right. So you really want people that are going to be action takers, ones that are ready to do something now about it because they recognize that it's not working. <laughs> yeah. And even mentally too, like talking about like productivity coaches, talking about like anxiety coaches, talking about, you know, anyone that has, you know, something to do with like brain and like high performance, stuff like that. At first, you might think, it's, how do I price that? Like, how do I measure like, how much you cost them or, how, or what is the value? But think about it like this. What is costing them every single day by not being productive, by not mm -hmm. having a clear mind, by being very anxious? This goes back to, you know, even, yeah, even the example of you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or also in your own vision, in the consequences that you wrote down, right? right? For your own vision. What right. happens if I don't achieve this vision? What are those consequences? That's really what you're you're basically promising them they won't end up at with your product or your service. Exactly. Right. So that's really what you're having them avoid. And so you're valuing your service or product based on that, that you are not going to allow them to get to actually face those consequences in person. Yeah. A, a good exercise I like to go through um, is essentially asking myself what other areas of my life or of their life is spilling over this problem. It's like affecting this problem. Because it might be a problem that you have in your business, but you start talking about it, you start getting deeper into it, and you realize that, oh, you're carrying a lot of that stress into your relationship, and into your kids, and therefore your kids are now you know, mad at you, and now your wife doesn't really want to talk to you or sleep with you. And, and, and yeah, next thing you know, you're like, man, like, this is a huge problem. So what started as like a, a small little problem of like, oh, maybe I'm just not productive enough in, in my business. Eh to like, oh my God, it's affecting my whole life because I'm not where I, where I need to be. All of a sudden the problem becomes very big and all of a sudden, yeah, you're gonna be making them way more money in the future if they implement your, your advice. So yeah. that's why again, pricing it between 2,500 to 10,000 is actually a no brainer for most people that have a big problem that's affecting their life. And again, it can even be on simple things where people have, voids that they are filling with either things or program or information and again think about it always as that bridge right exactly okay moving on to how to validate your offer so the marketplace is the only true way to validate that you have an offer that your ideal avatar truly desires it is near impossible to craft an amazing irresistible offer on your very first try so be prepared to continually hypothesize, test, and revamp your offer multiple times before you get it right. This is completely normal, completely normal. and it is to be expected. Okay. Yes, so we can't stress this Yeah, enough. we keep revamping ours. You know, we, 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 we keep taking feedback because this and is not forever. Be. Yeah, yeah but this is not something that just like, oh, you do once and like, that's it. Like, that's how, that's how businesses die. You need to always be putting yourself out of business, as they say. You need to be uh, ahead of your own self and like, you know, designing and thinking about like, hey, now what's happening now? That's how you miss the train. But what's happening in the future? What do people want in the future? What's going to happen with this problem or this solution or this system? And yeah, like you want to be able to always get the feedback, not from your own head, but from your marketplace. Exactly. Okay. So we're basically going to give you this... Um, this template, if you will, how to create your hypothesis on what exactly that irresistible offer is going to be. So it's the ideal avatar, irresistible offer, desired results, hypothesis. 
And so within this hypothesis, this equation here, you have two constants. You have your ideal avatar. That should be a constant. That is the person who you are serving, the person who has who a very big chosen. problem. Yeah. yeah, so has a very big problem, and you are trying to find, you know, filling in the gap. Yeah. What is that irresistible offer that is going to get them to the next constant, which is the desired result? Yeah. And so really the only one, you know, while in the beginning I recognize even picking the niche and getting who that ideal avatar is and discovering what the desired result is can be very difficult. But once you have you know, a pretty clear image of what that is, you want to stray away from constantly changing those two constants because you won't be able to test this theory very accurately at all. And so your variable is the easier assistable offer. You're trying to figure out what is that one thing, what is that thing that's really going to bridge that gap and get them there successfully, efficiently, and it's going to make them extremely happy and thankful for the service that I provide for them. Okay, so as an example, let's say the ideal avatar for you is a health coach. So that's your first constant. And you know that the desired result, the next constant, is that they just want more clients. They, they want to get more qualified clients for their coaching business. And so you need to figure out what is that missing variable. Is it Facebook groups? Is it Facebook ads? Is it funnels? And obviously the first time when you, you know, make this educated guess, yes, it is going to be a guess. You're going to have to go out and do some research, but at the beginning, you're not going to have all the ins and outs of this market of exactly, you know, what they think that path is to get there. And so there is going to be some guessing involved, but it will eventually get to a point where you have dialed that in even greater based on the research that you've actually done, the feedback that people have given you within that niche. Yeah. And last week, you should have gone really deep into your avatar with all the right. you know, you should have questions. Idea, but... You should have a pretty good idea, like I would say, because... If you've done the work, if you've gone out there and you've like started to talk to people, you started to create your own like list or Excel of like what bunch of this ideal avatar, ideal people look like, you know, your best guess, of course. But as you keep refining, then it becomes this feedback loop. And you wanna see it that way, but if you don't take action, if you just like guess, you maybe pitch it once or twice and you get discouraged, like it's not going to work and you're going to start doubting if you pick the right niche and if you, you know, have the right offer. And like the best thing is to go out there and to start asking and to keep refining. And again, we're going to give you all this material to keep reiterating. Re exactly. And so just to exactly reiterate what you just said. So why people tend to fail in crafting an irresistible offer for the exact reasons that you just said, yeah. right? Reason number one is they continuously change the constant variables in their hypothesis. So they change their ideal avatar, they change the desired result. They, you know, they take a guess on an irresistible offer, it doesn't work, and they're like, oh, well, maybe it's my niche, maybe it's the avatar, maybe it's the result, maybe they don't really want that. And you start changing all the different variables and the constants and expect to have some kind of clarity yeah. on what was yeah, the piece that worked. That. You're never gonna be able to judge that properly. You have to change one variable at a time. And in this case, there is only one variable, and that is the offer. Like, what is that thing that's going to fill that gap? Yeah, like a, like, like, a, like, a, like a scientist. You know, exactly. Literally. This is a scientific process. Yeah, it's like, okay, a little bit of this substance, and then you test again. Because if you add so many, then you don't know which one did what. Exactly. You know, it's one, one variable at a time, and going, yeah, the right. marketplace. Right, and we did this... Oh, very we did this extremely often in the beginning of our journey yeah we seriously. would think that maybe it was the niche maybe this isn't uh you know change. a niche we, that's we without even trying yeah or we think that maybe it was you know we didn't really you know what the desire was and we change a bunch of different things every time and we'd never just make a freaking decision we, we, didn't, <laughs> even, we didn't even have this formula to be honest it was so much more abstract in our head of what it looked like too. Right. so consider like you're so blessed like you're listening to this like you have access to like top quality information and the reason why you're probably not gonna find this just like you know out there that easily is because not many people know about this you have to pay like big bucks and have to like partner with the right people um to find some of this thing so like really cherish it and you know what's funny like just thinking of our story mm -hmm. that you know a lot of times some of the best advice came to us but we just didn't believe in it enough 
So it mm -hmm. came and they said, for example, you need to know your avatar really, really well. And we would say in our heads, well, how much does we actually really need to know? Or you well, know, how, we, how deep think, is it really? Or we think that we, we did. <laughs> we thought that we did sometimes. Yeah. But we didn't have a clear enough understanding. Yeah, we, but we didn't really we didn't have yeah, enough questions. We didn't understand how in depth it really had to be. And so I mean, you don't know what you don't know. Sometimes the advice does show up, but because you are not where you need to be yet, or even mentally prepared yeah, to you can, you know, it kind of just flies over. Right. Exactly. You you listen, but you don't really hear it. <laughs> right. So yes, yeah, so we take it from us. We've uh <laughs> yeah, we've gone through a lot of trial and error. And so we know this is Extremely valuable. Don't be changing a bunch of your, don't be changing your constants, changing your variables at the same time. You will yeah. not know what was what. Niches are always evolving. And you'll end up confused. And, and like we told them, like last week, it's like the grass is green where you water. Yeah. So remember that, you know, like don't get stuck thinking that you're like selling your soul to like that one avatar and that one result and that one. Like mm -hmm. there, they will be changing, but you need to find, you know, that sweet spot. Oh, you learn by taking action. And you learn by taking action. So, exactly. Take action. Just pick and go with it. Yeah. If it's wrong, it's wrong. You change it. You try again. If it's wrong again, you change it. You just keep going yeah. until you get the right one. Yeah. If okay. it was so easy, yeah. there will be a lot more, uh, you know, successful entrepreneurs right. or whatever out there. But it takes time to understand who you're really serving, why, and all those things. Exactly. Okay. And then reason number two. So that is obviously forever guessing and assuming what your ideal avatar wants without ever actually asking them. <laughs> and we're guilty of this too. We were convinced for a very long time that we knew what our market wanted, that we knew what our ideal avatar right. wanted, even though we weren't that ideal avatar. So I don't know, we thought that we were psychic, we thought we could jump inside their mind. We, just, we were convinced yeah, yeah, kind of so different things that we sometimes knew. Sometimes entrepreneurs and us, you know, we tend to be very, you know, very idealistic or overly optimistic or overly confident about yeah, certain Yeah, overly things. idealistic. It's just going to happen on the first time. Yeah, it's going to be, oh, amazing. Yeah. I, I, I know this well. I'm inspired. This is all going to go perfect. And you just have to remember that there's nothing better than just asking, right? So asking things like, hey, listen, like, like I'm, tr I'm trying to come up with a really cool offer. Um, I would love to ask you a couple of questions. Or, hey, listen, you know, what would make blank result amazing for you what would make this product or if they were to come out there with some awesome new product like what would you want it to have what would you want it to do for you just questions like that and right. and, and you started digging the consequence because you start connecting the dots you're like oh it's affecting this area and it's affecting this other problem and it's costing them this and that and all of a sudden you start putting all the dots together and you can start combining physical products with information with you know again like going above and beyond mm -hmm. exactly. what other people are doing in marketplace. Exactly. So we just want to get everyone out of the state of assuming mm -hmm. and guessing forever because you know, as Sam Ovens, the example he always gives yeah. is, you know, if you're, let's say you're standing at a bus stop and you see a girl named Susie across the street, but you don't really know Susie and you're trying to guess, you know, what does Susie want for lunch? And you have never actually spoken to her. And you're just making all the assumptions in your head. Maybe she wants a sandwich, you know, maybe she wants mm -hmm. spaghetti. Mm -hmm. Maybe she wants, and you just keep going on. Well, maybe you should actually just go over to Susie and ask her. And maybe when you go and ask her, you find out that she actually wants sushi for lunch. And so it's, it's as ridiculous as that, as seeing a complete stranger and thinking that you have any idea what they want for lunch or what they're going to have for dinner or what they're studying. You know, it's, you don't know. Right, you've never met the person, and so assuming it just doesn't make any sense. You're gonna to have to get to a point where it's based off of some actual data. Okay, so while well, taking an educated guess about your irresistible offer is necessary on your first attempt, every revised hypothesis thereafter should be adjusted based on cold, hard data. So again, you know, you are gonna to have to make some kind of educated guess, you're gonna to have to go off and you know, some things that you maybe have seen a few people say without a lot of research though yet, and you can make some guesses, but after every attempt, after the first one, there should be, you know, you change your hypothesis based off of actual feedback that the market, that the ideal avatar has given to you. Okay, so it should be based off of data. And we are gonna give you sheets at the end of this lesson on 
you know, sheets that can actually walk you through, you know, how many attempts you should be making, how many reiterations you should be making, and make this just like you said, a scientific experiment until you get the right combination. Yeah, and again, this this can happen in in a short amount of time if you are like actively putting in the work, going out there, and and you'll see like people will will tell you and. You know, we recommend, especially at the beginning, like jumping on the phone with, with people because when you start having those conversations, like you'll be able to literally even sell people on the phone before you even have the product, as we saw, as we said before with this like pre-selling. And that way then you craft that promise, that vision, that desire self really well, you sell it, and then you can go to your lab and work on your product and deliver. Right? So mm-hmm. yeah, very, very straightforward there. Once you find that, of course. All right, awesome. Let's talk about power positioning, okay? What is positioning? Why is it important? Um, you know, how do you create positioning? So let's, let's dive into this. All right, here's a very cool definition of positioning. Here's the place that you hold in your customer's mind. And you will see this little diagram right here that has high price and low price. You know, if you see the north and south right and you got like commoditized and differentiated and we touch a little bit of that in the avatar but i want to dive deeper because this is how you're going to be creating and standing out no matter what niche or blue ocean you actually decide to uh create for yourself so uh we see that it goes from like very generic value branded premium and super premium as as it goes like in this straight line you know from like the lower left corner to the right um, top corner. And we're gonna go into some examples in a bit, just remember this. Now, positioning is about being known and being perceived as the best, okay? And I, I found this image I thought was really cool, the generalist, like look at all these different, you know, cogwheels that he has versus the specialist. It has like two cogwheels that function, amazing, that's it. It's less like oiling, is less parts because again, the more parts you have, the more pieces that can go wrong, the more maintenance you need to do it. And, you know, again, do you want to be sewing a <laughs> field that has all these different things or you want to just do like corn and have this massive corn and every procedure is the same and it's specialized? Right. Because corn obviously has very specific problems, very specific, very specific needs, problems, <laughs> exactly. very specific needs, and you just want to go into those instead of trying. 25 different vegetables. Yes. And believe me, there's more than enough problems out there. And in an ocean of information, people are looking for transformation. People are looking for that straight path and, and for you to come and essentially like fill that gap. So check this out. Positioning is kind of like being on a stage in front of a thousand of your ideal prospects. Think about it like this. Okay. Just look at all these people right here. Imagine they're all cheering for you. They're all ready to buy your product or your service or, you know, they're, they're just so ready for what you got to tell them. But let me ask you, how will you want to be introduced before you speak in this event full of raving fans? What do you want to be known for? What's your positioning that you hold in people's minds? Now, here's another great example to understand positioning. And I'm going to go from the green all the way to the red, right? So let's start. Winning zone. Notice that it's exactly what the consumer wants and what your brand or persona does best. Again, this could be a personal brand as we always recommend, um, but just calling it brand here because the brand is your name, (laughs) essentially is what it is. So it's that superpower, is that uniqueness, is that system, and exactly where it intersects with what the customer wants that's that's the winning zone but here is a dumb zone if you're literally just competing with some with another one of your competitors and it's not even what the consumer wants like that is the dumb zone then you got the risky zone which is where all of those meet because again if you're doing what your competitor is doing you're not creating that blue ocean and so it becomes risky we talked about this as well and of course you're the losing zone because you're no different than your competitor you're giving the customer exactly what they want and there's nothing that your brand does best that's yeah, a losing zone does it better than you. yeah yeah that's your losing zone so green winning zone that's where you want to be in positioning 
And here are seven questions to help you open the door to position. All right, so let's look at them. Number one, what is your superpower or unfair advantage? And I will call uh, one of my uh, mentors here, Scott Olford, where uh, it was the first time that kind of got me thinking about this with, um, you know, in, in depth. And, and he said, listen, like, <laughs> and going back to that ideal avatar uh, lesson we, we, we talked about last week, it's that perfect junction of what your passion is, what you're good at, what the marketplace will pay for, and, and it becomes something that you're just really good at, like something that not a lot of people can do that. And if there are people, there's always ways to differentiate because you are unique. Number two, what is your superhero identity, right? So even, even in Marvel and in all the different superhero movies and X-Men, like all these people have superpowers. So if you were to just look at them from that angle, you will say, well, they're all the same. They all have a superpower. But when you start going into that specific and unique power, then you realize like, oh, there's something very unique that it brings to the table. So what is that identity that makes you stand out from the rest? Number three, what do you stand for or against? This is key because as a brand, as a persona, you always want to stand for something or against something. And usually you create this you know, polarization um, by doing this. Number four. What will you be remembered for? We talked about that example of like, how do you want to be introduced? This is very similar, but it is more of your legacy. It's more of how you want to be remembered after the fact. Um, five, what is your story or the story that you're communicating, that you're telling? You know, and, and what I mean by the story is that macro story, like specifically your journey, what you have gone through, your realizations, and you know, if you look at it as, uh, again, we keep going back to Lord of the Rings, very easy example to, to, to put together. You know, the story in its essence is very simple. It's this ring that corrupts people that needs to be put to death. And if by doing that, everyone will live. Cool. Like that is the story. Like that at its, at its basic framework, that is the story. And so that becomes the positioning because no one else has a ring that you got to take and burn. No one else has you know, this mission is specifically with this specific storyline. So just think about that. Six, what is your unique methodology system? Okay, and I'm going to show you some very cool examples of some of the things that we've done. And what is your unique mechanism or your unique vehicle? Again, talking about the gap, talking about that bridge that we showed you earlier. That is the vehicle, is the, the, you know, mechanism that is getting someone from point A to point B. Now you might still be thinking, what is it, what if I'm still not sure about my unique gift or what my superpower is? Right? Don't worry, because there's really only three ways to create a unique mechanism or this differentiation point. Okay. Let's go through them super, super quick. First of all, we got the actual mechanism. And you can think about this one as like an actual mechanism, the scientific discovery, a uh, raw material, some sort of crazy algorithm that someone came you know, up with. Again, like something almost like proprietary that, you know, no one really uh, knew before, that it just became, oh, known, uh, a new chemical compound, something like that. Two, there's the unspoken mechanism. This is one that no one is talking about it in the industry, but is worthy of mentioning. And I love the story that uh, Todd Brown, if you follow him, you'll know who he is, uh, talks about, and where he says that, he was hired, you know, by one of these, the biggest like beer company in the world. And they were puzzled because they're saying, you know, we're actually like losing, you know, this year and, and our competition is beating us. Like, how can we stand out? Like there's so many oh, new fresh brand and, and young brands that are coming in board. And this guy's been in the business for a long time. And, you know, it's interesting because they took him to this factory and then he looked at his process and he said, wait a minute, what is that? And pointed out specifically to, you know, this unique way that they were packaging, just bottling their, uh, you know, beer, brewing these beers. And they say like, what, what about that? Like, you know, why does not anyone talk about this? And they said, well, like everyone does it. All of my competition does the same thing. And they said, ah, but no one is talking about it. 
everyone is just, just thinking, you know, almost like taking it for granted, right? No one's really talking about it. And, and so by choosing that piece of the process and highlighting it, it became like, like something insane. Uh, and another great example is if you remember when, uh, this was years ago, when milk was like a boom and everyone was saying like, you need this for your like calcium and like your bones are going to grow and all these different things. And like, yeah, it does that, but not at that level where it's like the most amazing thing for your bones and things. And we know that now, but at the time it was on this unspoken mechanism. But, and that became, you know, almost like a common truth. Like everyone just started believing that. Right. Until this day, most people actually do. Yeah. It's not like it, I mean, can't help with calcium, but you can also get calcium from broccoli. Right. <laughs> and before no, no one was talking really, about yeah, that before exactly. all of a sudden you know it became known for that right is that positioning it becomes known for that yep. and if you my if you're saying hey listen i i don't really have something proprietary you know something that anyone can do i don't really know exactly what to what is it you know highlight that's like interesting and emotionally appealing i don't really know well you have number three which is the creative mechanism because guess what we also were in that same issue of like just not really knowing this said you know how do we do this i don't even know these terms you know that i'm teaching it to you but this one is one that you can create that you define it that you come up with that is your unique methodology with your unique name with your unique process unique right. system and this is the one that we are actually going to be teaching you specifically and you will find that actually in your tasks after this lesson you may i mean hey you may have an actual mechanism and you may have an unspoken mechanism maybe you do Maybe it's a blend, but for the majority of people, for many people, they're going to need to create their own creative mechanism. Yeah. And we're going to show you exactly how to do that. Yeah. And what that does is essentially you become known for that which you create. And the more you speak about it, the more you water that grass, the more, the more they'll start getting to know you for that and you'll become your position. Now, here is a very easy way to see this. I want to like simplify this. I don't want you to, you know, overthink about these things, you know, in your head, just like I did, <laughs> because reality is they're in a current state right now. And as you see, not really happy. And there's one, two, three, four steps. And then boom, desire state. And look at that big smile. And those are the key steps to bridge the gap. Again, you take them from the current state to the desire state, from being unhealthy and overweight to being healthy and, you know, in their ideal way, their like fit body, right? Um, and you can call this the blank method, right? It's, it's, it's just a step-by-step, -step. a couple of keys that you've put here that you know you know, cross that gap. So let me give you another example. If I were to say, you know, the current state is someone that doesn't have a website. The desired state is website. Well, what are those steps? Well, you have to find a domain. You have to put the copy, the message, like what's actually going to go on the website, right? You need to put maybe pictures. It's a third step. Maybe a fourth step is like launching or you know, it's promoting or something like that. Boom. All of a sudden I have my step by step. I call it something and I say, Hey, this is how you can easily go from point A to point B. I'm not selling a million things. I'm only selling how you can make a really cool website that you can be known that you can, um, yeah, like keep using and I'll call it the website master method. Cool. I got something already. Right. So let's look at some examples here. You got classic retail to the right side. Brands like Burberry, Ralph Lauren. It's very iconic, classic, very, very expensive, very, you know, highly priced versus, you know, Lacoste, still somewhat expensive, somewhat iconic, but it's more on the contemporary side. Just interesting. Tommy, same thing. But now let's look at some of the ones that are understated or contemporary. It's just like Calvin Klein or Brooks Brothers. You can Google some of these brands. Here's another great example. Look at where the M&Ms are on the lower left versus Lindt chocolate. 
And again, someone might say, hey, like, why are lint chocolate like, you know, 10 times what the M&Ms are? Mm -hmm. Like, like for, for a little pack, right, of them. And you and, and it's like, hey, like, did it take more chocolate to make? No, yeah. probably took even less chocolate to make. But their process was refined. Their positioning was premium right. and high price. Just a note about even the packaging, because when we were of kind course, of going through the presentation together, um, I mean, Ferrero Rocher and Lynn Chocolate are the ones that, oh, even yeah. within my family, I mean, yeah. I tend to buy my mom those chocolates for Christmas. I'm not going to go get her a Kit Kat or a bag <laughs> of M&M's for Christmas. That's right. I'm going to give the kids something like that. And, and actually, the packaging is more, I feel, for children, right? When you see Mars Bar's Kit Kat, it's very, not that adults can't eat it, of course, but the branding is very bright. It's very colorful, things that kids tend to be drawn towards. Uh, whereas Lint and Frere Rocher are definitely more elegant, right. more classic looking. You know your that's... avatar. You know your avatar. You're selling it to, to parents because they want to, you know, keep their kid kind of quiet when they're like freaking out. And here, here, here's some chocolate. You'll never be giving your kid like Frere Rocher's. <laughs> <laughs> that would be silly, right? You, you save those kid. for, for <laughs> gifts, for, uh, you know, special occasions. Again, this is all positioning. The chocolate might not even be 10 times as amazing. Like, so people might even enjoy some of this uh, M&M or dairy milk way better than lint, but it's position, position. Here's another great example. And we're going to even dive deeper into cars to take a very good look at this. And it's just an easy example so that it, you know, you drive the point home because if you understand positioning, believe me, it's going to, you know, make a big portion of the heavy lifting of attracting the right people and getting those sales effortlessly. Now let's take a look. You got Ferrari, you got Porsche. They are producing lower volume, which is interesting, but they're way more defined, way more specific. They target a very select group of people that have high income, that want luxury, that want experience, that want status. Versus Toyota, Hyundai, Ford, they make them a higher volume and it's, what are they known for? Well, they're known for being economical. They're known as being reliable. See, different association, different right. words it's that you're associating. More, you know, like the average, the average Joe or a family man. Yeah. Right? Someone who has a family and needs, you know, a safe car that's going to get them from point A to point B. It's, you know, going to buckle the kids in safe. And you're probably not going to be, you know, going to get a no, Ferrari or a Lamborghini or something like that when you have a family of four. Right. <laughs> exactly. Know your avatar. All right. Now take a closer look at positioning in the automotive industry. What is BMW? Because again, like you might you might say, hey, that's really cool, Andres, but what if I'm competing with all these different brands on the same exact quadrant? Well, here's how you differentiate yourself, and this is positioning. Look at BMW. They're known for driving. They want to seem like their wheel and their steering and all this is all about like the driving, beautiful. Whereas Le uh, Lexus is more about luxury. And you can see it in their cars. They, they, you know, all of them have like, you know, very fancy uh, interiors and details. Mercedes is prestige. This is more reputation. It's more like the status. It's more you want to be seen. Significant. Sign yeah, you want to be seen. It's different than the luxury. The luxury, it's more like comfort. Like, like I want to be in this like very, very comfort, very, very, you know, luxury versus um, prestige. Just give, give me one sec. Someone's uh, uh, at the door here. Just one sec. In packages delivered. <laughs> now let's look at Zion here. Youth. Toyota, reliability, Volvo, safety. If you watch the Volvo commercials, they're all about safety and they will keep driving over and over and over the story that it's about safety. Toyota, that it's about reliable. Lexus, that it's about luxury and they'll stay true to their brand. They're not gonna go out there and, and say, well, mine's very reliable. I and mean, mine's very safe because that's not your position. So you want to keep your message consistent with that. <laughs> Again, if I'm targeting youth like Zion, and actually Zion here in Canada, 
just got kind of extinguished. Like it just, it just disappeared. It, it was not a brand that did well. Yeah, there were not enough, or 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 the way they did it, it wasn't. It's not enough young people in Canada. <laughs> or, or not enough. I would say not enough young people that are interested in that. I think people are more trying to go into the prestige and luxury. They don't. Yeah, they, they don't I have want to be that. honest. I've never. You never I've even never heard. heard of that. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. So even though the positioning was, uh, you know, different. It doesn't mean it did, you know, all their marketing and message might not have been on point, right? So just remember, remember this example because you want to be able to differentiate yourself and be consistent in telling that same story. All right. And you want to understand how the market on average cycles through products. So check this. Out. You're going to love this. This is really, really cool. It's going to kind of open your perception to what um you know kind of how the market works this is the law this is a law of the fusion of innovation or the adoption theory you know very fancy term just to say when a new product comes out let's say talk about facebook for example or an iphone first there's only two and a half people two and a half percent of people that will buy it then early adopters will buy it it's like it, it, they enter a new a new frame now it's 3.5 then the early majority, that's when it starts coming into the mass market. And so again, if you're starting or growing a business right now, you are not gonna try to go for the late majority or laggards or early majority because you're gonna have a, such a hard time penetrating the market. You wanna start with the innovators and early adopters. That's the sweet spot, especially when you create a new blue ocean, which is what we always recommend. Here's the example, watch this. It's introduced at Harvard, okay? This was when Facebook was created. Only 2.5% of people knew about this and were investing. And guess what? They took it from this to other universities. And a students from other universities started like adopting it. Mm -hmm. Those are the early adopters, 13.5%. Now, it's key that you see the yellow line because when you cross that over, you go into the early majority. That's when now you can look at 5.5 million US users. But now, guess what? The parents are jumping on Facebook. The early majority probably would have been us, right. our generation. Right. Because I think it was 2007 when I got my first Facebook account. Yeah. Right. So I was remember? in grade, yeah, I was in grade 12. And then my mom got it a few years later. <laughs> right. So yeah, our parents went on Facebook. Yeah. My mom must have got it maybe 2000. And Right. Yeah. yeah. And then, <laughs> That's uh, true. And then the grandparents, right? Those are the, <laughs> well, the, the laggards. And a lot of them, uh, a lot of people still, you know, are, are in that category. And it's interesting because it doesn't even necessarily need to be someone that is old. You know, here is just for the example's sake, but you could have a laggard that simply just doesn't like technology. You know, it's like, you know what, I, I just want my, my pager or I want my like Nokia, like old phone, right? Yeah, it depends. Know your avatar. Yes. Now, you might be thinking, what is the difference between positioning and branding, right? We talked about these brands, these nice things, and of course they go together, but what is, what is the difference, okay? I'm going to drive this one. Positioning and branding. Let's take a look at this. Number one. Positioning is rational. It's the expression of your company's strategy in precise phrases that convey differentiation, role, and relevance. Again, when, when I show you the example of the Lindt chocolate, example of Ferrari, right? Like it's in, in very few sentences, in very few, you know, as the example you gave too of like the health coaches specifically with specific result, like it, it becomes your position versus branding that is more emotional. It's now the expression of your company's strategy. It's, it's kind of like the left brain and the right brain. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Strategy in words, tonality, sound, color, design, imagery, and illustrations. So how you feel when you engage with that company, mm -hmm. that business. Exactly. Positioning versus branding. All right. Positioning. Value proposition versus the personality of the brand. Competitive differentiation versus the emotional experience. Why buy me versus what is your experience? Category or buyer segmentation 
versus voice, attitude, and style. Again, we talked about like niching down, like that segmentation of the buyers. Like, is it a you know woman with three kids or two kids? Or if you're selling a product for pets, for example, is this a you know ginger cat? Is this a, you know, Labrador or, you know, what kind of dog is it versus just the voice, the attitude and the style of it. Tangibles versus intangibles. Problem solve, your secret sauce. Again, well, that's why the positioning comes there. Proof points, superpower versus just the feelings, aspirations, associations is more around the, again, the feeling, the right side of the brain. Engaging in sales cycles, an influence category versus unified broad product line and commodity market okay this might be more applied for retail uh, but nonetheless great example of positioning versus branding and the lifespan you know positioning can change after you know one two years something along those lines because positioning sometimes is to penetrate a different market like we we, we, we said here you're gonna position it different for innovators than for early adopters you have to there's different they're different people with different beliefs, with different, right? It's like, Values. yeah, I'm going to talk to the students from universities different than the parents, different than the, right? Like it, it really goes back to knowing your avatar and knowing how to play with positioning in your favor versus the branding that you're building all in the back of this personality, like who you are, and it can be five years right. to a life. This is definitely, yeah, branding is the more personal side, right? So I think, was it Toyota that was reliability? Right. Right. So with the tangibles and positioning, you know, they are probably the problem of unreliability. We're mm-hmm. saying this is safe. It's a reliable car. It's going to get you from point A to point B. Whereas the intangibles, the associations are, you know, family, middle class, right. two kids. That's, right. That's kind of the vibe. It's kind get. of the vibe. Yeah. If I, if I tell you, think of a minivan, what comes to mind? Soccer mom. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because exactly. it's, it's that association, right? So here's our own personal example of brand positioning and how we grew our agency to six figures plus in less than a year. Our positioning was funnels and social media. Why? Because they were, they were fairly new. A lot of these businesses didn't know about it. So we created a blue ocean when we found you know, this information and we applied it. The brand was the bull size blueprint. This was what we were using to differentiate ourselves in our own process and unique methodology. It looks something like this. The bullseye blueprint, how to create a powerful identity, tell your story effectively and attract a consistent flow of dream clients without wasting time or money in the process. As you see, very specific to what we're trying to promise here. It had three, uh, four specific uh, processes as well, like like those stepping stones. And I'll actually, I'll even show you here. Um, give me one second. All right. This was the lead magnet, the PDF we were giving, you know, people. And again, you can pause this video later. You can, you know, do whatever uh, you need. Hope that you are seeing this, the, you know, what I'm sharing here. Um, if not, well, we'll, we can include it on the resources, but it's just an example of brand positioning and how we used it to, you know, grow our agency. Here's what we're doing now to go from six to seven figures. Our positioning now is high ticket online products for entrepreneur couples. And our brand is the impact formula, which is again, where you're on right now and the, our unique system and our unique positioning in the marketplace. Now the real power happens when you combine brand and position brand and position here is a 30,000 foot view and I want you to think of your brand positioning as a whole that it's how you want to be presented the word of mouth perception of other brands <laughs> your expectations the target audience so it's a conjunction of your positioning and your brand all of that forms your brand position. And in short, you wanna think of your positioning 
and unique process as the specific stepping stones that your customer must take to get to the other side, just like I showed you with that other slide with your methodology. And your brand as the feeling, tone, and color that will make your journey come to life, or their journey, sorry, um, come to life because it's for your, uh, for your customer. So here is a very easy, very easy example, very clear way that if that is your customer, just map out exactly what is that process because your message will be built around that. Your positioning will be based around that and it will make you stand out in the marketplace and allow you to position yourself in one of those quadrants depending on how you're positioning yourself. Now, here is one of the secret uh, you know, things that I learned. I call this secret because it's inside his book, Expert Secrets, and I love this. It's actually helped me close a lot of the deals and stack on value, and it looks something like this. He calls it the stack slide. And he divides this into essentially six pieces. Number one is the masterclass. So just see it in your mind as like the product, the main core thing that you're giving them. But watch how he has tools, things that aid that. He has three tangibles. So three things that they can say, oh, okay, this is awesome. Like, you know, this is something that I can use that I can almost like, you know, materialize into something and a bonus that is priceless. It's a way to build and stack on value where the value seems that it exceeds way over the price. It's just a very easy way to do it. And again, sometimes it can be a PDF as a tangible, or it could be a mini course, a you know call with someone and spending some time uh, you know with with you directly, right? And and you can price this and you can make this stack into something that becomes extremely valuable for them using a similar format and pricing, not on time, but on value. So I hope that made sense. And guess what? Now it's your turn to create your unique positioning and craft an irresistible offer, along with getting crystal clear about your process and your unique system. Okay, and so your action steps were week four. Number one, you're gonna complete your ideal avatar, irresistible offer, desired results, hypothesis worksheet. And so that's where you're gonna get a very, you know, you're gonna make your first official hypothesis on what it is you really think your ideal avatar wants, and thereafter you continue to get feedback and adjust as you see fit. Number two, complete your irresistible offer worksheet. This is essentially where you're going to start getting into that unique process yeah. and that unique methodology, really clarifying what that is. And third, last but not least, as usual, please upload your weekly debrief video in the Slack community by 11.59 p.m. EST. That's Sunday? Oh, on Sunday. That is Sunday, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> forgot to put that there but you know the deal <laughs> yeah and I love this quote um, just just to wrap it up because if there is you know a great example of you know bridging the gap right mm -hmm. is Jesus and he said unto him I am the way the truth and the life that's it that's the positioning <laughs> the way the truth and the life no man cometh to the father but by me it's a blue ocean it's a blue ocean. <laughs> no, it, it's it, it's an amazing, um, you know, powerful verse because it literally bridges the gap, specifically on you know the 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 old law and being uh, lost into being found in from death to life, from lies to truth, from our way to the way, right? And so you know, I hope that this lesson and as you go and do these exercises, um, that you find this new passion and this new fire in you as you understand that hey you are unique and this is how i am unique and this is how i'm you know introducing myself and and you have some creative um you know freedom in doing this and you're also going to your marketplace and testing and validating so it's like you know think yeah, about it as like a you know like the perfect combination yeah to, you know, the, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, because we as humans tend to kind of want to, you know, go to extremes in either one or the other. And we've definitely had times where we were too far to the creative side and vice versa. And this is really going to get, you know, the perfect offer that's based off 
real data, you know, real feedback from the marketplace, but simultaneously giving you that freedom and ability to create something of your very own right. and make something of your own. That is, it, it does give a very unique sense of, yeah, kind I of guess, like fulfillment exactly. and, you that's know, someone, clarity. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Someone achieved an outcome, you know, specifically. They could have gone to anyone, but they went to you yeah. with your specific method. It's a very, it is a very fulfilling thing. Yeah. Um, I also add here that when you create this unique mechanism or you talk about if it's the unspoken or the actual one, whatever, you know, whatever you end up wrapping up here and packaging, mm-hmm. you know, it will allow you to create curiosity in your marketplace and in your niche because there's no one else that has that specific system or process or you know you know thing that you are are creating but you also want to be able to go out there and ask people and say hey listen what do you think of this what do you think of the name what do you think of you know because again don't don't just go on your own guess and presupposition and then be sad. Yeah, because like that happened to us. It happened to me specifically even before my wife came where my first company was DTK Productions, mm-hmm. right? And, and I became attached to it because it was emotionally right. attached. So I was like, oh my know. gosh, my favorite, my favorite business. Like I didn't want to rebrand even though like everyone was telling me like, hey, you need to position yourself differently. And I was like, no, no, no. Like I know I can make it work. Like I was just attached to it. I wasn't listening to what the marketplace wanted, but I just wanted to have this product done, or I wanted to offer this or that. And like, don't don't guess. Like you know what you can help people with. Ask yeah. them. Enjoy the creative process. Right. But learn to it's fall both. in love with mm-hmm. getting your clients' results. Yeah. If you fall in love with that, you're winning. Yeah. If you fall in love with, with helping your client, with like talking to them, with, you know, making content, making, you know, stuff that people are really going to value and you start getting people's feedback, then it's easy. It's easy to go out there and grab that information that your client or your prospect or your, you know, potential uh, uh, audience or whatever it might be, um, the feedback they give you. And then with that, you go back to your cave to your laboratory and you make iterations on your offer and the way that you present it and your positioning and you're always shaping this so don't don't think that is like a one time and that's like it you know like if if there was a way to get it consistent every single time uh i i don't think that there'll be anyone out there um, starving because people will be able to predictably do it, but it takes time because markets are always evolving. Even people that have done successful campaigns, every time they launch a new product or a new, you know, uh, webinar, a new campaign, a new funnel, it's like, man, like you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. And you don't no one knows the future if it's going to work yeah. until you go out there. If we as humans can barely understand our own problems and how to solve them, it's not easy trying to solve someone else's problem. Right. And the best way is to make it into this, um, you know, committing to this never ending improvement and, and student like of your mark. Exactly. So move on to some Q and A. If there's any questions. Yeah, we have, let me see how long do we have here? Yeah, we have like around 15, 20 minutes for some Q and A and I want to just pull up as well. Some, uh, you know, frequently asked questions when it comes to positioning or when it comes to, um, you know, any of this stuff. So I'm going to like go into, into the chat stuff and just see. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's see here. Hey, what's going on? Mm-hmm. Any, any questions when it comes to positioning? Any questions when it comes to... Um, you know, how to present yourself, how to differentiate yourself and how to package or create a offer. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah. And, you know, no worries. You know, I know there, there, there's people that are, you know, catching up and we understand, you know, again, that's why you have access to the recordings and you can kind of like make up for the time. That's no problem, mm-hmm. but definitely do it in order because one thing lock unlocks the door for the next thing. It's like, yeah. well, it's like the, a building block. it is a building block. It's like the vision really helps you like go deeper and understand really what you want. Then you go and move into the avatar. You start getting to know the avatar. Yes, definitely yeah. a lot of trial and error. <laughs> definitely. And yeah, for a very long time, I think we were 
really hoping that we'd be the exception. Yeah, I, I think we, <laughs> we tend to do that. First or second time, but I mean, it does happen, but it's it's rare, and it's kind of just learning to really embrace yeah. <laughs> embrace that journey. Like yeah. that's what entrepreneurship is like, no matter what market you're in, and yeah, you will get there eventually. It does take a lot of humility, though, to really admit that you really don't know much in the beginning. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, one thing, though, I will say is when you are going out there and talking to people, like it doesn't need to take you a long time to figure out some of this stuff. Yes, it is trial and error, but it's also not, you know, something that has to be super lengthy because if you have put in the work and responded the sheets, like you will have a very good idea. Like this, this system is not, you know, just meant for, uh, you know, just go out there and like you figure out like all, like all these questions. If you can answer those questions and 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 go out there and like validate it, and people are kind of confirming your answers, confirming right. what you wrote. Yeah, and you can. It's gonna be. It doesn't yeah. have to be yet. Yeah. Sorry, it's really hard. It's really hard. A decision like obviously it's based on circumstances. Well, but it doesn't have to be extremely yeah all right so here's a, some really good ideas uh, or some really good questions um how do you know if something is dead in the water oh sorry uh yeah let, let me read above sorry mm -hmm. um, i need to have xyz service or product ready and then experiment with positioning and offers um you need to have the offer defined not necessarily the service or product ready right like that we go back to the whole like pre-selling aspect of it no. Uh, yeah, it's more yeah. like you are you are hypothesizing what you think that irresistible offer is before you've created. Let me show you. Created it actually, um, and cool. then you're going to test that in the market space to see if that, you know, as you explain it to people and you discuss it, if that's really what they want before you even create it, because you want to have a proof of concept basically before you actually spend time making it. Because what if you make it and then you realize it's not what they want? Right, and we made that mistake too. We built everything, and then realized, oh, yes. it's actually you want to make, want. Wanna make sure people want. Exactly. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny because one of the first things we we heard uh, early in our journey was, you know, find a hot market, ask them what they want, give, it, give it to them. them. You know, that that's the simplest formula for success. And when you're starting, is the best way to do it. Yeah, sometimes you can give them a trial of some sort. We're, we're going to talk about you know creating like a lead magnet we call it like I, I we showed you our um you know blueprint that we had with all these different tips and advice and checklist like you know providing value to them and so if they opted in for something called how to create a powerful identity tell your story effectively and like you know if they're interested in this then it's easier for me to say okay i know what they want because they proved it with raising a hand you know, yeah. symbolically yeah, yeah, by opting in. And so now I can go back to my lab and say, okay, I'm going to put a really cool offer that says, Hey, this is how you can create a powerful identity. Yada, yada, yada. In six weeks for specifically this person that can, you know, go from point A to point B in the most efficient way possible. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I hope, um, I hope that answers um, your question. How do you know if, or when you need to drop an idea, you uh, you do that after, and I'll show you here. This is uh, one of the sheets. You want to be making twenty to thirty offers. Somebody, on what I mean by offer is pitching, like telling someone, "Hey, do you want blank? Mm -hmm. You know, right. what, would blank be good? Like, is is blank what's gonna, you know, what you've been looking for? Is blank what you would want? And again, they'll tell you, they'll be like. No, or some, some will stop answering. Sometimes they get awkward and things like that happen on chat too. No problem. Like, you know, brush out that stuff and say, hey, listen, you know, I know you might not be as interested. We'd love to know what would it have made a better offer to you? What would you like to see? And you will be surprised when you ask people in a very, you know, polite way what they tell you. Um, and you can go back and reiterate and right, and some of these questions here are actually yeah, be specific. You exactly. Know, what this what are the objections you. that they're giving you? You know, what do they seem to be liking, or what are they interested in? Maybe it's only a part of what you offer. So right. you find that yeah, only one fourth of what I actually offered here they wanted, and the rest they had really no idea even what that was. Maybe right. you know, that does happen. Yeah. So yeah, one sheet is essentially 
uh, and look, you're gonna see this signal versus noise because you wanna you wanna get a good idea of like what are other people saying that it's just becoming noise, you know? Or maybe some people will say, hey, listen, blank is what I want, and you realize that oh man, one of my competitors has a signal. Well, that's good, but now find how you can package it, position it, spin it differently, and then with that go back and, and, and you'll see it says what what version number is this hypothesis because I wish I had these sheets when I started like I really wish because we went so many times into just out there and then we would get discouraged and then come back and want to switch it all and like just start over and it's not the right way to do it because you want to make sure that you're you know iterating talking to the market going out there and pitching and coming back and, and making adjustments and believe me your, your mind is smart like you you'll start making those connections and you'll see that oh man like you know there's a question over here that's like um what things is the market liking or interested in how are the conversations ending or what's the conclusion of each call i should add here slash like chat you know what patterns are emerging what things keep recurring this is a key question because you will find specific patterns and then you'll be like oh like everyone's telling me about this like i and, and you'll be surprised you'll be like man i thought this was the cool thing or like what like what i would have wanted but sometimes when you assume as they say you make an ass out of you <laughs> and me <laughs> right so yeah this is uh you know one and then this is the other one that is your irresistible offer where you're gonna take the time to go through the steps and that stepping Maybe stones you, um, an example of ours so I know this may not be the most straightforward thing to create. And yeah. Right because we've done it. So we gave you an example of kind of, um, you know, the impact formula of what, you know, first iteration of what that was yeah. and how we, how we created that. So, yes, we think this will be definitely very helpful in helping you realize, you know, what is the process I would take someone through? You know, maybe yeah. similar to someone else's, but it's never going to be exactly the same. Yeah. Exactly. And just, you know, going back to this, because I think it's just very, very key. You can, you can, you know, emphasize it enough. Um, you know, just look at it like this. And again, this could be emotional. This could be just a need for, you know, having something awesome, you know, uh, in their apartment or in their uh, office or something, you know, people that sell like high end paintings, people that sell like, you know, different things just to just for the environment but yeah the current state is that the environment looks crappy and boring and, and they are willing to pay big bucks to get a you know people i think you've seen it too people that buy a long um like aquarium and they fill it mm -hmm. with fish and they spend like 25 grand sending this with like salt water and but but like why because their desire state is like man that's gonna make my office or my home look like million bucks yeah and so what what is that gap right and, and and what are those steps well you first maybe have to go and ask what kind of fish they want maybe you have to ask the size of it maybe and, and, and you have this specific of kind of like how it works type of thing so um yeah there's different ways different demos different uh, ideas on how to do it and again come up with that offer based on the stuff, based on the avatar, based on conversations, and go out there and test it. And you'll keep making adjustments until boom, you'll be able to just sell it over the phone, and then people will say yes to it, and now you get to work, and now you got cash, and now it's so much easier to, to move forward with some cash leverage. Yeah? Yeah. Exactly, so yeah, we hope that this week goes well with you know creating your first official hypothesis about what that irresistible offer is definitely of course again only after you dialed in who that ideal avatar is you know what to get them and then just start testing yeah and eventually over time you will get that dialed in perfectly and then you can officially you know begin creating yeah. the offer yeah and again it's, it's like, sure. as long as you are promising to deliver and do the absolute best you can do that is how the process works right you're already assuming that you're going to deliver to the best of your ability so it says um so if people are not responding to the idea well over and over after modification then you might have considered a different x y z yeah exactly it might be just like a completely different angle maybe there's parts that resonate but but not the the core thing and um to give you a quick example um, I had a client, uh, Guido, <laughs> he was selling electronics, he's in the electronics niche. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for a long time, he was trying to get people to 
uh, you know, his main promise or his main offer was like, hey, I'm going to help you how to become an electronics master faster. And I said, like, don't, like, you're selling an improvement offer. It's like, you're just offering them a faster speed mm-hmm. versus, like, I'm going to teach you how to become a pro if you're a beginner. It's like, a, it, it was a very clear defined gap between like, oh, I'm just starting with electronics and I want to be a master. So it was so much better to target the people that wanted to become a master that were just starting, which is someone that is already experienced that wants just to do it a little bit faster. Right. So I guess that the beginners must have heard that and been like, well, maybe it's not for me. I'm not advanced. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm not not even fast at all. I don't know anything. (laughs) Right. Exactly. And he, and he saw it was a wider market, better position just because there are other people doing what you want to do. We shouldn't be discouraged because it comes down to the offer and position. Exactly. 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 Like, you know, you can have the same chocolate, you know, and, and, and a lot of the times, even in fashion, is the same exact it's shirt. The same factory, yeah. Kind of the same freaking, <laughs> yeah, like even in Walmart, like I, I've found like the same exact, like, you know. Yeah. Uh, Walmart and Abercrombie and Stitch, <laughs> what's the difference? One smells like Position, Positioning and offer, it packaging, like message, yeah. Um, it says, yeah, this is so hard to swallow. Yeah, it is. It is hard to swallow because, you know, you realize that like, you know, most of marketing, most of like the industry or whatever, it's formed on just avatar, positioning, and offer. It could be the same raw materials, but if you find a more unique way to position it, and yes, you are packaging it different. Like like this example this is another good example. Um, make, make sure we show it. Um, Kobe, you guys can see on the screen. Yeah, like more, it does not equal more. You know, in here you're selling a specific value of a desired meal versus all the raw materials, right? You're saving I mean, them time. You're saving it's them time. like a lifestyle. It's, it's convenience. Yeah. Yeah, so you want to uncover that web of pain, that web of value that you're offering. So it could be, you know, yeah, it's costing them this much, but I'm also saving them time and they're also learning this. So therefore now all of a sudden, boom, the value goes up. But the best thing is like, listen, you come up with a really cool idea. Go out there, pitch it to people and, you know, ask them. Come up with your, with, with, with your own way to just say, hey, listen, you know, how would this look for you? And that's why we have this little like almost like grading system that we got it from Sam Ovens, like a, you know, amazing sheets as well. Because here's the thing. You might be at six, you might be at five, you're not that certain. But when you go out there and you start pitching and then they say, yeah, that'd be really awesome. And you're like, man, like, boom, you become more confident. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it, 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 in order to do market research, um, you can really do it any of the social media platforms. Yeah, I mean, it could be any by Facebook groups. Facebook groups is from what we do. Yeah, uh, that's been trending on ones. Yeah, Facebook groups is easy because there's already communities, like clumps of people that are gathered together for the same Asking reason questions, or the same topic. Each other. Yeah, they're literally there to yeah. argue. Reddit, other. Reddit to Amazon. Amazon.com is oh, an amazing yeah, place to, to see too because a lot of these products are already proven or, or angles are already proven. You can see there's like thousands of people that have left reviews dive into the reviews and be like, Oh, what are people happy about? What are people unhappy about? What are people complaining? about? Sometimes you can find those things that people are complaining from the competition and you're like, aha, here is a gap that not a lot of people are filling and you make your positioning around that. And all of a sudden you got a winner. So yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. When it comes to marketing or just business, a good one campaign could be the difference, but it's hard to pull off sometimes, you know, like Coca-Cola did what did a campaign recently here in Canada where they launched those green cops because they were trying to be all like environmental friendly or whatever. And so like they changed that they're like a red cap for like the green one and it bombed. It bombed. Well, is it because people <laughs> saw through that? They saw through that. Yeah, obviously not. It's not their, posi- it's not their positioning. Sure yeah, let, let the environmentals do the environmentals. Don't try to be everything to everyone because you think you're going to get more sales. You stick to your positioning of like Coca-Cola equals happiness and that's it. You know, yeah, like, like do what you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 Let's be honest. and that's what happens when brands start losing credibility and they come up with new things like Gillette. Gillette, let's just talk about that for, for a second. Oh, that commercial. Yeah. yeah. Like, 
cool. You, you got a commercial that's viral, but I don't think it was a, a great strategy because here's the thing. Right? I don't think it was a great, I think it was a great social strategy of like getting, you know, their brand more out there. But I think their customers are the ones that want the manly man stuff, are the ones that, that take pride in that. So being positioned as like the like toxic masculine, like all these different things that they were saying, even though the message was right, they were to, like they, they were talking to like not the right avatar. Like that's not the one that buys their product. Do you use Gillette? I don't use Gillette. Nobody does. I've I've used Gillette in the past, and yeah, it's like it takes pride in that, like you know, very very good feel, you know, and 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 and, and yeah. being pride in in your in your manhood, right? It was a good message. I'm not against the message, but they imply that men in general are toxic. Yeah, they and they implied that. Um, yeah, I was, I was sitting here wondering, I, I am not any of these things you said. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so maybe, it, yeah, I did, I did read some of the comments too. Like, I definitely agreed, like you said, with the message. But yeah, I guess I left a lot of men kind of like, maybe they're assuming that their market, a lot of them were like that. And a lot of them were kind of saying, like, you know, that, that's not me at all. I don't yeah. support any of those. And the funny thing is that, you know, you got the complete opposite, which is the Dollar Shave Club, which is all about that. Uh, oh, I'm trying to find this picture. But anyway, it's it's all about this like super manly, like you know, elite group, you know, that it, it was competing. You know, it is competing against Gillette directly, and yeah, it's like I, I feel like all the people that were Gillette. Uh, users ran to these guys because they're like man like like that's not a message that resonates with me because a lot of these guys are like people that take pride in the opposite they don't want to hear this soft message so maybe it was a campaign aimed for the women maybe for the women but i don't really understand what, what they did i just thought it was um you know not the not the smartest move and, and i think it hurt them especially because you know afterwards i saw this ad Uh, I wish I could find it here. This one. Yeah, it's like a few days later, this came out. I promise you. I promise you. This was like literally. Are you joking? Yeah. And it's like. Oh, come on. You can tell. You can tell that's like. No. It was all for. Yeah, it was three days. Right. So, yeah. Not actually what you believe. Right. Yeah, that's the toxic masculinity right there. Right. In action. Right. So it's like just because you make like one campaign specifically for, you know, one specific purpose, you might be shooting yourself if you're not communicating to other parts so that are doing completely called, different this campaigns. Is this is called color with a green cap. Yeah, exactly. So I hope that that example kind of was driven home. Like, you know, in short, like know your avatar because all your message will come from hey are you selling raw veggies to someone that wants to make them themselves or are you selling this specific the specific desired meal already so all, all, all done sweet. together mm -hmm. right so know your avatar we go back to that you know key lesson of you know last week um of, of your ideal avatar because from there all decisions will stem you know because the mark is the one that will tell you like even even where it's at and how you're positioning it so go out there, explore, talk. Are oh, you still laughing? Yeah, it's 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 ridiculous, right? And and I was trying to find that one that 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 it was like a split screen. And it was like, it was like you know, uh, men are toxic, da da da. And it was like it was like a scene of like the 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 commercial. And then it was like split screen, and it's like meanwhile or like in the meantime or something like that. And then the other one to the right, just just very funny because sometimes brands will do that. Or even artists sometimes will do that. You, you, you will see like we are like spots of like, why is like Lindsay Lohan or like, why is like, uh, like why is Ed Sheeran rapping in a club? Right, right. Just like things like that. Right, right. Where, where, where they start to get out of their niche trying to create a blue ocean. And, and that's cool. You can experiment. Maybe they the, the were trying to the marketplace. They're like, hey, you know what? Why don't we put Justin Bieber with Usher? But and it may, worked. But, then you may lose loyal fans that but you may yeah. lose loyal fans That's that are true. like, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So know, know, what know what you're doing. And, and it always like goes back to market.
penetration, which is this part, you know, like what we talked about, of who, what segment are you targeting, why you're targeting it, um, and then going um, a, away from that yeah. as you as you grow and as you evolve. Yeah, so I hope that answers um, that question. And, and yeah, I think just going back to, to, to those basics uh, would, be, would be key. So, yeah. Cool. Well, we'll say goodbye over here. Um, I hope Thank you, you all enjoy this lesson. Yeah, it was really awesome to you know, talk about position, talk about the, the offer. And believe me, it, it don't, do not make it that complicated. You know, the product is just a bridge. And if you, let me just pull this because this is so key. Like if you are able to get clear on your avatar and their problem, which becomes a constant, like that is the problem, the biggest problem. And then you create a very awesome offer. Then it's almost inevitable that you'll be able to bridge that gap and you can assign, you know, high value to it. And you are able to, um, yeah, start generating, you know, cash flow uh, fast for your business without having to start with a wrong positioning or, or, doing all the work I always see, you know, coaches and people out there like creating, like taking months to, to create a course only to launch and then it bombs. It looks great on their website, but you ask them how the traffic is and they'll tell you that it, like no one's buying that's and that's painful. And we almost did that. We're like, yeah, let's create the course, whatever. But it's like, no, like you, you, we need to make sure that that's what they want and that we can get them there with a specific proven process. Cool. Yeah, so we hope you enjoyed and we hope that those the worksheets you know, really help you clarify what that what makes you unique and yeah. what your gift is and yeah. And feel free to reach us out. On uh, Slack. Yeah, on Slack or a message away. Uh, submit your stuff, accountability. We're we're right there with you and just let us know um, yeah, how you how you make it out. Yeah. Okay. Take care. All right. Take care. Take care, Daniel. Take care, guys. Bye bye. -bye.